Hi there, Mark Anderson here, bestmortgageanswers.com, presenting episode two of Answering the Internet. Today, I find myself on a website that I really like, nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, it is a kind of catch-all personal finance resource with really well-researched uh, information. Uh, the articles are generally very well written. They're relatively comprehensive, and they tackle all kinds of personal finance subjects, everything from insurance to budgeting to, of course, mortgage. Now, I'm a little bit of a tough customer to please when it comes to mortgage information that I see online. Uh, fact is, the majority of what I see, particularly those uh, kind of top 10 tips to do the thing better on your mortgage, most of those websites and most of those articles are absolute garbage, uh, perpetrating all sorts of propagating all sorts of myths, uh, erroneous information, etc. NerdWallet, even though this is a list article, uh, they do a good job with the list. They, they treat the information seriously and it's clear that they've, done, that they've done their homework. However, although I really like 12 of the 13 answers on this list, there's one of them that caught my eye and uh, reminded me to talk about APR. So the article in question is 13 mortgage questions to ask and the answers you want. It is question number five that caused me to raise my eyebrows a little bit to shoot this video today. So question five, what is the annual percentage rate? I'll read through and provide some commentary along the way. Now that you have an idea of what your payment rate will be, it's time to find out what your annual percentage rate is. The difference between the two? The APR incorporates all of the embedded fees of the loan. Ask your lender if any discount points are included in your APR. The answer you're looking for is no. You can always decide later to buy discount points, which are extra fees you pay up front to lower your interest rate. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there and mention just a couple things. So what APR is supposed to be, is it's supposed to provide the consumer one number that they can use to make an apples to apples comparison between different lender offers. Now, as we covered in my first video, I referenced the fact that there is kind of a hole in the regulatory standards in our industry that mean that the quote that you're gonna get from lender A is gonna be in a different format from lender B and a different format from lender C, et cetera. The APR in theory could be used as kind of an equalizer to say, okay, we understand that all these quotes are in different formats, but if we get everybody to accurately disclose their APR, the consumer is still in a position where they can make that comparison. If the APR worked that way, I would be fully in favor of it. The problem is it really just doesn't. So if the goal is to provide the consumer one number that they can use to make an apples to apples comparison between quotes, it actually fails on that count. Now, it fails on that count for a number of different reasons. Uh, one is touched on uh, here. So right up at the top of their answer here, they say the APR incorporates all of the embedded fees of the loan. Well, this is actually not true. There are a bunch of fees that you pay as part of the mortgage closing process that are not built into the APR calculation. Now, that in itself, um, it's, it's maybe not even, I, I might not even be able to call this an outright error, but it does give me a jumping off point to highlight really the problem with APR as it stands now. The fees that are used to determine the APR calculation, there is a standard set of fees that are supposed to be part of that calculation. But it turns out that different lenders can calculate it different ways by using different assumptions as it relates to those fees. And there's one fee that's used in the APR calculation that can be used to, let's say, artificially make an APR quote look lower. What it's related to is prepaid interest charges. So depending on the day of the month that you close on a purchase transaction, we have to collect interest from that day until the end of that month. That's called prepaid interest. Now, APR says that that is one of the fees that has to be used in the calculation. Well, if lender A knows that you're closing on your loan on the fifth of the month, and they're trying to give you an accurate set of numbers, they're going to give you the prepaid interest associated with closing on the fifth. It would be either 25 or 26 days of total interest to include in your fee estimate. Now, lender B, maybe they don't know when you're closing, or maybe they do know when you're closing. But for the purposes of their APR calculation, they're going to assume that you're closing at the end of the month. If they make that assumption, they can build in only one day of prepaid interest into their APR calculation, thereby artificially making it look lower. Now, this is just one flaw of many with the APR, but I think it's the most egregious one. Um, the other reason that you can't rely on APR to compare between quotes is that it assumes that a mortgage quote can really be summed up 
by looking at just the interest rate and certain closing costs. And in fact, we know that this isn't true, particularly for anybody that's looking at a loan that carries private mortgage insurance. As soon as you add PMI into the mix, you have something that is not included in the APR calculation directly and can vary between lenders that you're talking to. So the cost of the PMI that you're going to get through lender A may be more expensive than the cost of PMI through lender B. Long story short, it's just fuzzy. The math behind it is fuzzy. It's open to manipulation. It's not a great tool for the consumer to make that accurate apples to apples quote, uh, quote comparison. So I'm going to read through the rest of this and provide just a little bit of additional commentary. When you have zero discount point APRs from competing lenders, you can see who has the lowest fees for the same payment rate. Now, I really need to pick on this sentence because what they're doing is they're kind of backwards justifying the use of APR to see who is offering you the lowest in fees. Given some of the problems that I've pointed out with APR, that it's open to manipulation with that math, why not simply look at the fees and look at the rate as two different variables that are part of the same uh, overall evaluation? You've got to look at the interest rate that's on offer. You've got to be able to isolate the lender fees that lender A is charging, the lender fees that uh, lender B is charging. You don't need to bake all that into the APR. You can just ask the lenders, what are your lender fees and what is your rate? So we don't want to rely on something that's open to manipulation to get an answer that you can get more easily in a way that's uh, much, much less easy to uh, manipulate. In our example of receiving a 5% payment rate, you're looking for the lowest APR based on that payment rate. Maybe one lender offers you a 5.25% APR and another a 5.5% APR. The 5.25% APR lender is charging you fewer fees. Now, in this canned example, uh, I would agree that, uh, especially with a quarter point spread between the APR, that that would indicate a large difference in the fees charged between these two lenders. However, most of the time the math doesn't work out quite that black and white. Uh, the numbers are going to be a little bit closer, even with a heavy uh, actual variation in the amount of fees charged. Uh, and again, you can just look at the fees as an independent variable from the interest rate and see who's charging you the lower uh, fees. A higher APR is not always a bad thing. Say you're buying your forever home. If you buy some discount points to lower your payment rate, you'll have a higher APR. But after some years, you'll make up for the additional fees by paying less in interest thanks to that lower payment rate. Again, we're relying on APR as the tool to tell us whether something is worth it or not, or whether lender A is offering a better deal than lender B. The question of whether or not you should buy points, you can actually do a much more simple calculation. What is the cost to reduce the rate over here? How much does the monthly payment reduce from that investment? And you can just do a break-even calculation between those two variables. You don't need to rely on this, uh, this kind of vague uh, calculation that is APR, that's open to manipulation. You don't have to use it. So I think that NerdWallet, in all, in, with all due respect, uh, I think that they're parroting uh, some, some advice that is fairly common that APR is worth a damn. And in my opinion, it's not. That is just my opinion. Again, we are legally required to disclose it, but I think when you're making your apples to apples comparison, it is going to be important to simply isolate the different variables involved, stack them up and make the comparisons uh, between the actual numbers, not using this kind of vague uh, equation to determine who's offering you the best deal. I just don't think it's a reliable tool and I, uh, I, I wish it was better. I, I wish it actually worked in the way that it was intended but unfortunately it really just doesn't. So that's all I've got for today. I hope you found this information useful. Um, I'm happy to engage as well. If you have questions, if I'm off base on something, please let me know. But if you like the video, please hit the like button and please subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be providing a lot more additional content uh, going forward. Thank you so much.